So after you've installed Blender on your system and you start it up for the first time, it should look something like this. It shows a splash screen with a logo and a version number and the user interface behind it and you can click there to hide the splash screen. So the first thing we're going to do is change a few of the preferences to make it a little bit easier for ourselves. So we go into the edit menu, the preferences option, which will show the preferences window. Under the interface tab, display section, we disable the splash screen so you don't get that every time you start Blender. Under temporary editors over here, we do render in image editor and under status bar, we will enable the scene statistics and the system and video memory. And what these three do is they show here in the status bar some numbers on the scene that you're working on, so the number of objects in the scene, but also how much memory it's using. After that, we close the preferences window and those preferences will be saved after that. So I've not turned on the full screen mode of Blender in order to hide the parts of my desktop that we don't want to see. And what you see here is the default interface configuration for Blender. We've got a large 3D view area over here with which we can interact. There's a bunch of object properties over here. There's a tree view of what's in the scene and there's a, another area over there. So this is the default. Now if we open a file, for example this motorbike.blend file, you will see that the interface changes. Now we have two 3D views, one over here, one over here. This part is more or less the same, but the panel down here has disappeared. So this is one of the features of Blender, is that the interface is fully configurable by the user and it will get saved in the file, which can be really nice if you want to work on a scene in a specific way. You set up the user, user interface the way you want, you save it and you can work with it in the same way when you load in the file back. So the basic mouse interaction with the 3D view, to rotate the scene you hold the middle mouse button and drag the mouse. If you want to zoom, you use the scroll wheel or if your mouse doesn't have a scroll wheel, you can use control middle mouse button and move the mouse up and down. And these are actually different types of zoom. So the scroll wheel is in discrete steps, while control middle mouse button is a continuous zoom. And for translating the scene in the view, you hold shift and use the middle mouse button like this. So one thing to note is that whatever area the mouse is located in is the area that the mouse interaction works on. So if we use the scroll wheel over here and then move the mouse to the other area and use the scroll wheel again, you can see that uh, it changes which view you are interacting with without even clicking the view. So in this way you can work really quickly between these views. And it even works for things like the, the properties menu over here. The scroll wheel there moves the menu. And if you get lost somehow in the scene when zooming in or translating or something, and you'd like to get an overview of the full scene, you press the home key and the zoom will adjust to show all of the objects within the scene. So let's make a first render of this scene by pressing F12. So what this does, it takes all the objects in the scene, the materials, the lights, the camera position, and turns that into a realistic picture uh, as seen from this camera over here. And as you can see, this takes a minute to uh, compute um, this is using the CPU right now to do these computations. We'll show how to do it on the GPU in a minute. Um, but still it takes about, well, a minute. So within this image view we have the same type of interaction as in the 3D view. We can use the zoom wheel to look closer into the pixels. Uh, we can use shift middle mouse button to translate. Uh, you can right click on a pixel to see its particular color. As you can see in the status bar at the bottom and press home to get back to a zoom of the full image. Now if you press escape, the rendered image disappears and we get back to the 3D scene as we had it before. And if you'd like to get back to the last rendered image, you press F11 and that will show the image view again. So F12 is to render it and F11 is to look back at the last rendered image. If you'd like to save it, you can go to the image menu over here pick save uh, and then for example save it to a PNG file or something else. So as I mentioned this was rendered on the CPU but if your system has a GPU that is capable of compute and you have Blender set up and your system set up then in here in this menu there should be an option GPU compute. And If I select that and press F12 again you will see that the render is a lot faster right now. So in most cases, it's a good idea 
to put this setting to GPU compute. And if this option isn't available, then please check the notes that we have within this particular section of the course notes for what you can do to check if your system supports it or not. Even with GPU compute, it still takes a couple of seconds to produce this image. So there's a different way in Blender, a second way in order to do rendering, and that's called the live preview rendering. So to enable that, we press the Z key and then pick in the shading menu this rendered option. And as you can see, more or less the same image is built up, although it's completely over the viewport. Uh, but this is actually an interactive view. So we can select objects here, rotate the view, zoom in, etc. And this is really nice uh, if you want to do editing on the scene, for example, change the lights, move objects, or change the materials to see what the effects are on the rendered view. We can go back to the normal view, again using Z and picking solid. So the shading menu that you bring up with the Z key, it's called a pie menu because the options are in a circle around the center. And there's two ways in which to use it. So one is I've brought it up now with Z and then I click the option using the mouse and then it's enabled. Or the other option is to press the Z key to bring up the menu and hold it. And now if you move the mouse to the option that you want to pick and then release the set key, it selects that option. So a bit of a shortcut if you want to work really fast with these types of menus. So something to note about this live interactive view, if I enable it again, you can see that as I interact with the view, it degrades into a very low quality view. But then if I stop interacting, it slowly builds up into a higher quality. So this is an optimization which gives you a quick view during interaction of the rendering, but you can then release interaction or stop interacting and it will still build up to the high quality. Uh, when you select objects within this view, which is possible, and then interact, you might see that the object outline is out of sync with the rendered view like this. Uh, this is not a bug. Um, the rendering is slightly slower being updated than the outline. So there's nothing wrong with your system. However, if you do find that 3D interaction like this isn't very smooth or even the rendered view is very slow, then it might be something to look into for your system with us. So let's look a bit closer at the scene that we have here. So we've got this motorcycle, we've got these walls, there's a light object over here, there's two cameras, and the area up here in the upper right is called the outliner, and it shows all the objects in the scene in a hierarchy. And if you click something in the outliner, for example this camera, you can see that we selected both over here and in the scene. Conversely, if we click like the walls over here in the 3D view, then it will select it also in the outliner. So these two are consistent. There is a bit of a difference when you select something in the outliner, it simply selects the object under the mouse cursor. But if you select something in the 3D view, for example, I click on the motorbike here, then Blender will need to search within the scene what is behind the mouse cursor. And if you have thousands of objects in the scene, then this click select can be very slow. So then it's probably better to use the outliner and find the round object you want to select. So here I've loaded in another scene to show a bit more about selection. As mentioned earlier, if you left click on an object, you select it. And if you'd like to select more objects, you hold the shift key and left click. And you can add to the selection. And as you can see, selected objects in Blender have an orange outline. Uh, there's one object that has a light orange outline, and that is the so-called active object. And for certain operations, that one is special, and we'll come back to that later. If you'd like to deselect, you can press Alt-A to clear the selection. Or another option is when you've got some selection, you click somewhere in the 3D view where there are no objects behind the cursor. Click there, and the selection is cleared as well. There's a different type of selection called the box select. It's where you hold the left mouse button and drag it, and everything that is visible within that box becomes selected, which can be a really nice way to select part of your scene. You can also use box select to deselect certain objects by holding control and doing shift left mouse button drag, and it will deselect all the objects visible within the box. Now, shift left mouse button to add to the selection is a bit weird, and it's best that you try that out in one of the exercises. 
because depending on the viewport and how many objects are visible behind the mouse cursor, the selection is influenced. For example, if I position the view like this, there's now three objects visible behind this position over here, and I use shift left mouse button click, you can see that the active object is cycled as I repeatedly click. But if I click on the cone object over here, and it's the only one visible behind the cursor, and use shift left mouse button click, it first becomes active. If I click again, it becomes deactivated, or deselected, actually. So yet another method to influence the selection is to use the outliner. By control clicking on an item there, you can add or remove it from the selection. Again, it cycles between being selected, active, or unselected. So notice that as we change the selection, the statistics in the status bar reflect how many objects we've got selected. So there's currently seven objects in the scene, of which we've got six selected. So this can be a nice way to check that you've got the right number of objects selected that you expect, especially in very large scenes. And finally, there's usually more than one way to do a certain operation within Blender. It can be through a shortcut key, as we already saw, it can be through a menu action, or it can be through a mouse action. For example, if we open the select menu over here, you can see in order to select all, we can use this menu option, or we can press the A key as a shortcut. And as we saw earlier, we can press Alt-A to deselect, and that's something that the menu will tell you as well. So usually the shortcuts can be found in the right menu if you have access to it. Another option is to use F3, and this brings up this menu. Then you can type in what operation you're interested in, for example, select all, and then it will show you which options match that description. There's a lot of them. And this is the select all that we just saw from the select menu with the A shortcut key. And then you can pick that from the menu and it does what the operation is supposed to do. So this way you can try to locate uh, a certain action that you don't remember the shortcut key or the menu option for. So once again, F3. Now if we press deselect, apparently there's no description that matches deselect. But if we enter select none, then we get back to the option. So usually you have to figure out the right description as well in order to find the right option. So a nice feature in recent editions of Blender is the so-called quick favorites menu, which you can bring up with Q. And by default it's empty, but what you can do here is you can add options and menu items that you'd like to access often uh, at the press of a single button. For example, if we go into the select menu, there's an option to select a random set of objects. If you want to do that for some reason, very often you can right click on this option, then pick add to quick favorites. And now if I bring up the quick favorites menu again with Q, you can see that it's there. Uh, it's also easy to remove. Just right click on the item within the quick favorites menu and remove it. And now it's gone. Within the course materials, we also provide a, a cheat sheet of roughly two pages uh, that describe and list the most commonly used shortcut keys and operation that you might want to use during the course. So please check that. Um, there's many useful operations on there and their shortcut keys.